West is, but my wife Beth and I are here, and we are so privileged to share with you um, literally a, a movement that, that we are just crazy passionate about, a, a, a way of looking at leadership that is, is, is making a big difference in churches, uh, not just here, uh, but lots of different places. So um, I'm going to share a story really about our walk, um, and it begins um, uh, with a little bit of my story I'll share in a minute, but it has, it has literally um, activated different churches at all across the UK and places, even places like South Africa and I mean, excuse me, uh, New Zealand and Australia and other, other places in the United States, people are starting to m- shift their leadership from a directive, kind of command and control leadership to a, an asking, inviting, empowering, releasing kind of leadership that I think comes out of the scriptures. I'm going to read briefly, and then I'll get to the slide presentation. Ephesians 4 says this, uh, verse 11, And he himself... Jesus gave some to be apostles and prophets, evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edification of the body of Christ. And this is what I want to zero in. Till we all, all of us, everyone in your churches, everyone in your family, whole body of Christ, comes into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature, the fullness of Christ. I believe this thing I'm going to share with you tonight is not just another fad to to uh, that'll pass. I I think the Holy Spirit is starting to bring people alive, wake them up to who they are, wake them up to the fullness of who Jesus is and who Jesus wants to be inside of them. So that's what makes this so exciting for us is we're seeing people come alive. We did a little uh, leadership time training today, and I mean, (laughs) the Holy Spirit just hit the room powerfully. I mean, I, I, I cried my eyes out. Watching God bring people alive. And so in a, in a minute, I'm going to have an opportunity for someone in here. I'm going to invite you now to, to take a risk and I'm going to live unscripted mind for the gold that God put in you. And so if you're, if you're brave or if just the Holy Spirit has you by the neck and won't let you go, I want, I want you to come. So this workshop is called Mining for Gold. Um, it's about leaders coming into a dimension of thriving like a plant thrives, like your garden thrives, and things are growing, they're expanding, they're multiplying, fruit is being born, but also uh, multiplying your influence and in where you are no longer trying to catch all the balls of life or ministry and make everything happen, but you learn how to stay in your unique God-given sweet spot and wiring and then help others come into theirs, and God's kingdom expands. Let's see if my clicker will work here. Yes, thank you so much. Give a hand for the tech people back there. Woohoo! All right. Okay. So this scripture was the the real impetus behind why we called a book that uh, I've written with InterVarsity uh, in out of London called Mining for Gold, and it's this right here. The principles that. God and the Holy Spirit is at work. I mean, we just sang it, but he is always working in people's lives to to, to shape people. It says he will sit, God will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Now, what does that mean? It means that God never, ever stops working in the lives of people. And a lot of times in church or ministry, we, we feel like we've got to make something happen in someone. Or we've got to, we got to you know, like, Holy Ghost, kick them in the rear and move them or something. You don't have to do that. If you invite the Holy Spirit and you begin to recognize the calling and gifting and you call people into what they're passionate about, no kicking necessary. I'll make a new t-shirt. No kicks necessary in ministry. They will come alive. They will start to be motivated they will start to have passion and drive that no duty or no command of another person can touch. This says that God will purify. God will take vessels like that in the fire. He'll take you through hard times, but when you come out, you're a vessel. So the first principle is that leaders are gold. Second principle is this, is that 
Each of you carry in the new birth a dimension of the person of Jesus. It says in Colossians 1.27, it says what? Christ is in you the what? Hope of glory. That Christ lives in the body of Christ. When all those pieces come together, Ephesians 4.12 we something bigger than any person comes churches the spirit of god fills the body unto the measure of the stature of fullness of christ it says in second chronicles of second corinthians 4 for it is the god who commanded light to shine out of the darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of god in the face of jesus christ but we have this treasure and that preposition refers back to the light of the knowledge of, glo- of the glory of God in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. So here's what God did. He took the gold of His pure nature and He injected it into every human. And they carry it. And what I'm just crazy passionate about is getting that out. I mean, I, we started doing it today and I mean, every single time, I'm like, Holy Spirit, Come. And I can just look at these beautiful people and I can just see the gold. It's exciting to me. And and when you begin to ask the Lord to give you eyes to see, He will. They carry the light. The treasure is in there. It may be in there and you don't recognize it or it may not look the way it should yet. But if you believe that we're made in the image of God, it's there. Just briefly, story of the the, the book. Um, I was raised in a, a family with a dad who was a, an army colonel, an engineer, and very, very you know, strong military type background. I was third of four boys, and we called him the general behind his back and, because he told us all what to do, and we were scared of him. But he, that, that was just kind of the way he did a lot when we were younger to keep us in line. But after that, I joined the military, got a, a commission as, a, as an officer, and flew helicopters during the first Gulf War, and I I commanded men, and I got, got that same military command and control, tell people what to do kind of style, was reaffirmed. Then I went work for a big company, General Electric, the, one of the Fortune 500 companies in our, in our world, and, and, and I got more of it, although even then things were starting to shift. They were getting rid of layers of management. People were starting to say, maybe we might see a new form of leadership instead of telling everyone what to do. Well, about my mid-early 30s, late 20s, got involved in the Vineyard Church and began to lead worship and get involved. And they eventually asked me to join their staff so I could become a pastor in the church. That was something I never really uh, thought I would do, but it was clearly the Lord. And so we took a step of faith. And in that point, I took all that command and control stuff that I had learned and tried to apply it to, to, to church leadership. And, and it works to a degree. To a degree, it does. But then over time, Not only did I begin to see it had its limitations, but I started to see that within myself, I was not thriving. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know my identity. And through a difficult period when I was in that fire, the Lord began to use people to start to mine for the gold in me. They started to say, you know, I think God might have a plan for you. (laughs) I think God might want to do something with you. You know, I had been burned out. Who's ever been burned out? Just wasted like I don't know if I want to be a Christian. If anybody with a Bible comes near me, I'm going to bite them. You just get to this spot. And I just, I just really run out of steam of trying to do ministry out of flesh and will. Do you understand what I'm saying? But they just began to minister to me and, 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 and encourage me. And then when I experienced coaching, I just discovered something. It, it, it all put the pieces together. And this workshop came out of a kind of a revelation in my first coach training where I was sitting in this Salt Lake City class and I thought, if we took coaching, put it with leadership and coaching together, I think it would cause a multiplication wave of empowerment. And, and what happened was Beth and I developed a course. We, we, we taught it two times in the United States. And then in 2016 in Leicester, here in England, we taught it. And it was supernatural. Just <laughs> took off and birthed now something that is not just a concept or an idea, but it seems to be a way people are pivoting to try to lead. And the influence that's coming out of it is just astounding us. So what am I saying? Mining for gold is four things. It's recognizing that the image of God is in all people. 
Our job is to see, it's everywhere, see it, open our eyes to see it, learn how to draw it out, which you're going to practice tonight. I'm going to do a live demonstration in about 15 minutes, and then you're going to do it after that. And then to see others as a leader in churches or businesses or whatever, or, you know, whatever, is to constantly be developing and looking at how to help people come into thriving and all that they're made for. So we, we look for gold. We help people hear God for themselves and make choices for themselves of where they think they need to be going as God's working on them and refining them. And then we help them invest that into the kingdom. So the book really talks about something that my coach, I was coached by a guy named Bob Logan, and he began to say things to me like, you know, you're wired this way and not that way. And I'm like, okay. And he said, well, there's this principle called the 80-20 principle. He said the people that are the most effective, the most alive, the most energetic, spend 80% of their working time in what's called their sweet spot. What's your sweet spot? It's a combination of what you're passionate about, what you have energy and vision and excitement for, how you're made, and the fruit part is how you naturally bless others and bear fruit. Everyone has one. And it's, it's this effortless place that God just comes through you and you, you're not even sure how. It's the grace of God. But this sweet spot, when he began to share that with me, and then I started to rearrange time. I started to let others do what they're good at. And I just focused energies towards what my calling is, which has to do a lot with leadership and communicating and, and encouraging and coaching people. It was like wind hit the, my life. It's like, it's like momentum came. That still astounds me. And it's, I don't think it's, any, it's not unique to any person. It's when you find it and re, get released into it, the power of God comes. I'm not going to go through all of these. This is in the book. These books over here, you can you'd be glad to uh, uh, have you get tonight if you'd like. But this is the principles that are in there. I won't go into the details, but God does the refining. You can't thrive when you don't know your identity as a beloved son or daughter. If you, if you operate out of anything other than I am a loved son or daughter who has got a perfect father. I'm secure in him. I'm living out of the overflow of that love. Any other foundation is, is going is, is to have its limits. And some of them, even like performing for God, are, are false and they'll crumble. Um, we thrive when we, and I've talked about design. How you're made is unique. When you get in touch with design, it's like, if you aren't science geeks, if you take water through a, 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 a certain vessel and then you narrow that vessel down and you reduce the volume, acceleration happens with that water. It goes through faster. That's what happens when you get in with your design. When you start narrowing your time into your sweet spot, it's like the power of God increases over your, and the fruit is born. Sweet spot. The cross, like in that picture I had, God's working to help you be refined when you're in hard places. That can't be escaped. That's the gospel. And last, thriving is a relational function. It's not an achievement function. It's not popularity, money, big church, selling books. It's none of that. It's loving God, being loved by God, and loving others. Any amount of accomplishment that's not relational is not true thrive. That's what God said. He said, love God and love others as yourself. So what I'm going to do now, I want to talk about the shift of leadership. I believe we're in the midst of a shift where we're going to move from the left-hand side where we've known a lot of business and structural leadership, maybe even of the last century, which was a telling, command and control, doing things out of duty, um, being centralized control uh, from a few you know, kind of super highly gifted people at the center, and we work hard for God. I think we're going to be moving, and, I, and this is happening in churches all across this country and all over America. It just, it's, it's a shift to more asking. Instead of telling, asking. More invitation and empowering people. More dreaming and living out of the fire that's inside of people instead of, I ought to, or I should, or a, a, a Christian would do that. That, that has limits, and it's, it, it burns you out. And more collaboration, contribution by everyone in the body of Christ and not just a few and living out of the overflow of union with God. So that's, that shift's really critical. I don't have time to develop it, but what, we're, what I'm going to demonstrate to you tonight is, a, is, I think, a part of that shift. 
So, before I do a live demonstration, I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. So this is, these are the four elements of mining for gold. Spending time really listening to people. One of the biggest obstacles that leaders have is no one really, they have no one to really unburden their heart with. When we live this kind of leadership out and we help the people with us or our peers or even people, you know, maybe some even people above you, and you slow down to listen. This love is expressed to them that helps them come alive. Secondly is asking questions. That's the coaching skill. But really, I mean, one question can change a destiny. When you're really listening, then you're asking Holy Spirit-inspired questions. People come alive. They, they, they think about things differently. They move in new directions. And then the beautiful part about Vineyard, which I love, is we do this in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. And then we, lastly, always, what makes this kind of a secret sauce is we don't just talk about things we say. Now, what are you going to do about your issue, where you're headed, we, we give them practical next steps, and then they do it. Quick story that I've told many times, but it's worth telling um, because it illustrates. Is this is about two hours southeast of my house. In, I live in North Carolina. Beth and I do with uh, our, our family. And in 1799, this young boy, Conrad Ree, was walking in the creek, and he was shooting fish on a Sunday morning, and he looked in the water and found a 17-pound shiny yellow rock. And he picked it up, and it was super dense and heavy, and he kind of waddled to the house, brought it up to his dad, John Reed, who was a Prussian soldier in the Revolutionary War, and he said, Daddy, I found a big rock, and it's shiny. He's like, whatever, yeah, nice. What should I do with it? He said, well, it's kind of hot up here in the house, and we need to prop the door open. Why don't you just sit out there, and it'll be a doorstop. It'll keep the door open. So for three years, this 17-pound shiny yellow rock was the doorstop at the Reed home. And then John said, you know, I wonder what that rock is made of. It's kind of attractive. Let's see. Took it down to Charlotte to a jeweler, and a jeweler looked at it, instantly recognized it was a solid chunk of pure gold. And he said, well, how much you want for it, John? He said, I don't know, $3.50 is a good week's wage. How about that? He goes, done. Sure. <laughs> it turned out to be worth $3,600. Which is a fortune. At fortune at that time, he could have bought multiple farms, all the horses you could need, and all the farm equipment. He was set for life. It turned out to be a gold, the first gold mine in our part of the world. Here's the lesson: if you don't know and don't see the value in something, it doesn't give you the, it doesn't bring you all the value that it can if you can't see it. And tonight, I'm going to put you into groups. I just want you to ask God to give you eyes for the people that you're working with. Ask Him to show you how much He loves those people. Ask Him to give you eyes. Because when you recognize someone, here's the, here's the key. When you, when you look at someone with the heart of the Father with faith, something will come alive in them. It's supernatural. And you can't fake it. You, you, if you don't believe in someone, they feel it. But when you see Him through God's eyes, they will come alive. I promise you. Barnabas was this kind of leader with Paul. He really saw the value in the apostle Saul and Saul before he became Paul. And he put his name on the line to bring the gold out of that great man. And now we know the amazing apostle that he is. Barnabas was like a coaching leader. So as you talk tonight with your people, deep listening takes every, every aspect. I'm kind of training you right now. But it takes all of your senses. You want to look at people's faces. Look at their expressions. Look at their body language. Look at emotion. Maybe there's tears. Maybe there's frustration or sadness. Listen with your whole being to what they're saying. You can ask questions like, hey, that was really interesting. Tell me some more about that. Or, and the key is this for deep listening. They sh- there should be 80% of the time they're talking and 20% you. Some of you are going to have a really hard time because you're ministers and you're going to tell them all the things that God has done in your life. You know what? It's not what this is about. It's about having the spotlight on them for a second. 80% of the time. So what, if you ever hear yourself starting to go, oh, teacher, teacher, I want to share the story. This reminds me of something I did. Shut up. Be quiet. Let them talk. It's not about you. When you're doing the mining, be quiet. Say to yourself, why am I talking? And then draw out. Also, don't form judgments on what they're saying be through your story. Don't 
When we really love people, we give them the freedom to be who they are. We don't put our little judgments on them and put them in little boxes. When you ask great questions, they're open-ended questions. They're not yes or no questions like, um, so, so, are you going to quit your, your job? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't do anything. It, doesn't do any, it's, it, it really doesn't help. The question is, what in your job is frustrating? And that's an open-ended question. Or, what type of jobs really bring you life? When you ask yes or no questions, is binary, and it binds people up. When you ask open-ended questions, they, they give more answers. You'll see that in just a second. Good questions cause people to think broader, deeper, wider about things, expands their thinking. And when they say, that's a really good question, you've done it. The third one is, is, and this is what I love seeing, is the Holy Spirit will come if you invite Him. Love this. It just comes every time. But if you watch and you have eyes to see, the Spirit of God will will literally help you bring out golden people. But you have to depend on Him. So I pray before every session, invite the Lord and you'll see that. And the last thing is when people come to a certain place, um, what makes coaching leadership or mining for gold more than others is, like we were doing some coaching this morning and people said, well, I want to do such and such. I said, all right, great. And when are you going to do that? And they're like, it's none of your business. I'm like, well, okay. But I think we're just having a conversation unless you choose to do something with what you think you ought to do. And they're like, okay. Tuesday, what time? Uh, nine. How long? Who's going to be in that conversation? What will be happening in the room? What are you going to need to do? Oh, get real specific. And then when you do real specific, what happens is people get momentum. Their, their life starts to take off in the direction of what they want to get to, and disciples start changing. Do that. So you have to come up with not superhuman actions, steps, just doable ones.